Everybody. So we keep uh, holding our program in English because the other choice would be Spanish. I don't know if we can really vote or for that. Italian. Or Italian. Or French. Or Or we switch in between. Okay. So today is the second day and we are happy to announce the, announce the, the I don't know, we always kind of, for the quick pronunciation, call this part an intellectual part, meaning that we are more talk, less rock. Unlike the Acusmonium, which is the other way around, we're more rock and less talk. But I think the important part of this um, slot of the program is that I want to quote one of my favorite philosopher, Daniel Dennett, <laughs> who said that as much as you cannot imagine building a chair barehanded, you cannot think bare-minded. So we need tools, the JRM tools, I think, has a proper name regarding to this history. We need tools, and now I talk more about the thinking tools because a big part of our work is how we think, and especially if we talk about the music, and there's a big part of how, you know, the how we do it, and the notation, do we need the notation, do we need any, you know, books and theory, why actually do we need the theory, is it helpful for us? And today, yeah, we start not with an artist talk, but with a conference, which Daniel once mentioned here that it's a boring thing, but the, of course, never with this gentleman, whom I'm very happy to have as a co-curator of our ambitious undertake, Russian Acousmonium. And um, I just want to quickly introduce, if you mind, that because uh, there is a very, I, I think, you know, something that we talk now as much as like, I expect that people are into the material, more or less, uh, into music or electronic music, so there is a very important concept introduced by Pierre Schaeffer, which is uh, called the sound object. There, is, there are sound objects, according to his theory, music objects, and um, through the years talking with Daniel, we discuss the importance, why it is important, why it is not important, what is that, what was it supposed to mean, what does it mean now, do we need it? And in the beginning, Daniel uh, was kind of criticizing these things to me. It's recorded in our interview that uh, it's on the in YouTube in our GRM talk of uh, June 2018. Okay. The composers quickly abandoned this idea, I quote. And then there was an interview of Daniel Teruji to GRM in the lockdown. And I read this interview and I realized that, in fact, the same person describes his daily life and the lockdown very much in the terms of categorization and arranging objects and arranging sounds. And I actually think that whether we like or we don't like this idea, we still do the arrangements of sounds, right? Even if we create a folder called 28th of July, Acousmonium, it's, it's an arrangement, so you make it an object, and then the next day would be the next object, or you classify them. Violin sounds, guitar sounds, whatever sound, noisy, long, so there are very many ways of classification. And then I called back to Daniel and said, you just criticized that, and now you actually do it, how come? He said, no, 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 we will make a conference. I will explain myself. <laughs> so here he is, I, I, I give him a stage. Thank you very much, thank you. Very you much. have another mic. Very happy. You yeah, know, because I may stand every now and then, so that's good. Huh? That's perfect, yeah. So, so I, just, I, be, I become a part of the Thank audience. you, thank you, Anton. You thank you for your introduction. 
So welcome here today. Happy to be with you again. It's my third lecture, or no, second lecture, or no, third lecture in, in, in St. Petersburg. So let's get immediately into the sum, subject. I'm criticizing two things. First of all, the concept of object as a philosophical concept. And secondly, the historical incidence of the concept of sound object in the evolution of music. Let's start. Is this a sound object? Is a sound object an object that produces sound? The answer is no. It's not a conference about sound producing objects. This is a sound producing objects as almost everything around us is. So we have been accustomed to work with in music with specifically adapted sounding objects, which are the instruments. But here we are at a more conceptual level. It's sound described as an object. So let me go through it. Let me try to answer to my own contradictions, as uh, Anton says. And let's start with our story. So first of all, a very short story of music. Not short, condensed, I would say. So let's say that in the history of music, there are three main traditions. The first one, oral tradition, I don't know when it starts, thousands of years ago. It's a consequence of the apparition of music and its main component, which is repetition. The fact that you do something several times and it creates a kind of second sense. There are many theories on how music started. Probably one of the most, for me, credible ones is related to work to human activity, to repetition of gestures, which produces the same sounds again and again. That may be. Oral tradition means that when something exists, it is transmitted orally from my mouth to your ear. You listen to it several times, and then you re-transmit it again. It's the beginning of music, and it is still running. Why? Because oral tradition is everywhere. If I learn how to play the piano, if I don't have a teacher who tells me how to play Chopin, I will never be able to play Chopin. There's something that's not written, that can only be transmitted orally. Popular music is oral tradition, 100%. So as you see, that exists. At a certain point in the 13th century, more or less, the moment is not important, uh, musicians started putting down sound on symbols. The history of writing music started then. And it was first some memory aids when people sang, for example. The no new noims tell you what to do. But little by little, it became a more complex system and it brought different things like abstraction, polyphony, symphony is impossible without something on which to write things down. And more important, or almost as important, the possibility of listening music with your eyes. You read a score and you can represent how it sounds in your mind. Then in the 20th century appears, let's call it in a very general way, media art. The fact that the music is directly, or image, cinema is a similar process, directly inscribed with its sound on some media. And that changes totally 
the result and the way of thinking and the way of acting and the way of talking about music. So let's start with a, another important background. Let's analyze a bit how music works. So on one side, you have the instruments. A knowledge kept by instrument makers, established techniques, and oral tradition. So somebody produces the sound producer, the sounding object. Then you have a codified system called the score, mainly paper, which is kept and transcribed. Then you have musical language, which is something between both. It's what tells you that if I read this note, I should play this key on the piano. It creates a relation between the written part and the sounding part. And the central element in the tradition is the note. A note is a symbol. If you're capable of reading it, that represents a sound. And since, and keep this in mind very strongly, since I know the sounds, when I say piano, I don't have to show you a piano or play a piano. You have a mental image of that sound in your mind. So I see that note for piano, and I can represent the sound in my mind. That's wonderful. The same thing with, with the speech. Music is not magic, speech is magic. You see some little black things on a paper and you know what they're saying. You create a relation between something which is external to something that is internal. Now, it's much more complex with an electroacoustic musical work. What are the characteristics of electroacoustic music? I don't know if you have been to concerts or to our concert yesterday. So any kind of musical work where sound is produced by technological devices. Composers invent the sound of their music. I don't want pianos, I don't want guitars. I want my own sound. So I create the sounds and then I put them together. It has different names, acousmatic, here in this festival, we use that name very much. Electronic, electronica, computer-based, etc., etc., And it's probably the largest musical practice in community, growing from techno to contemporary music. Technology covers all the fields of music today. The musical information is merged with the sound. I don't need a performer. The music is already there. No common cones, codes and known sound material for the listener. The first concept was developed by this guy, Pierre Schaeffer, in 1948. He called it musique concrète. We won't go into details on how, why he called it that way, but it's based in recorded sounds and sound editing and mixing technologies. It's very similar to cinema as a historical evolution. So, musique concrète, philosophy, procedure, or aesthetics. <coughs> Go on that side, it's easier. <coughs> philosophy. All the sounds of the world can be used to make music. We should enlarge the realm of possible sounds for music. Procedure. Use recorded sounds and sound processing techniques to bring the sounds of the world into music. Aesthetic, no clear instructions. However, the first works showed the road. So, in the center here, the blue circle, this, this is a, a fake, just to give an idea of the proportions, is the sounds that we can produce ourselves with our voice, talking and singing. Around that, in yellow, there are the sounds that are, were traditionally used in music. 
And for example, if I'm listening to a piano concerto and this happens, I don't take that sound as part of the music because it's outside the yellow circle. Now, the changing idea was to say this can be inside music. It's just a question of seeing how to put it in. So all of the sounds of the world came into or potentially usable in music. It was the composer's responsibility to take care of that. Now, one of the first concepts was that of sound object. Here we're getting into the theme. So Pierre Sefer, when he started working, needed a conceptual tool to understand, to work, to think the music he was making. Pierre Sefer was not intentionally a revolutionary person. He created, he generated a revolution. But his idea was not to change music. Arnold Schoenberg was a much more revolutionary attitude person. He started thinking how we could think music in a different way, through harmony. So he wanted to enlarge the realm of sounds for music. And he said, well, traditional music has notes that represent sounds. The concept we're going to use is that of sound object. We'll come back to that several times. So it's the intellectual equivalent of a note in musical writing, a unit for managing sound and organizing musical events. So instead of having do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, I have this sound object, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, and I combine them in a certain way. So it's intellectually, it is similar to instrumental composition. That was his idea. Its origins is in the Zeit object. It's a concept that comes around the 20s by a great German philosopher, Edmund Husserl, who developed phenomenology. And it deals with sound only through listening. Once again, let me make this sound again. You're listening to a sound made by an action. So Husserl said we should be capable of listening to that sound, forgetting the action, forgetting how it was produced in a certain abstraction of its cause. Uh, let me give you a much more precise example. Whenever I listen to a dog barking, I immediately recognize the source. It's a dog. But the dog may be singing in a certain pitch, and his spectra might be rich in some harmonics. But our perception will say dog. It would not say anything else. So what Husserl and Schaeffer claimed was how can I analyze or work with those sounds, forgetting their origin, forgetting what caused the sound. This, independently of my conference, is the basis of acousmatics. The fact that you listen to music made with sounds you may know, you may not know. And your mind is so accustomed to identify sounds because every action on the world produces a sound. And when we listen to sound, we immediately try to identify the action. It's stronger than us. So what happens when there's no action? There's nothing that's produced. Our imagination starts creating images of related to the sounds. And since there are many sounds together, music 
creates a continuity of images. That's what's sometimes so fascinating about acousmatic music. So Schaeffer, instead of talking of sight object, he talked of reduced listening. Let's listen to the sound, forgetting how it was done. There was a technology needed for that, the tape recorder, for example. You record a sound, so we're all today very accustomed to record sounds, and we listen to them, and uh, we had listened to them forgetting the cause. Even if this is very tricky, when I listen to Armando's voice recorded, or when I see a photo of Armando, I say, it's Armando. But it's not Armando. It's a representation of Armando through a picture, through a recording. And our mind is continuously going back and forth between the representation of something and its real existence. So this idea of reduced listening was very important for the development of uh, what was going to happen. So let me give you an example. So we start with a recorded sound. You don't have to listen it in any particular way. Just listen to the sound. It's a very, let's say, familiar sound. And if you live in Paris, you recognize immediately what kind of train it is, what service it is, huh? because you're accustomed, so it's a train sound. Now, let's make the abstraction of the train sound, of the origin of Paris, of everything. And let me show you the same sound in which I completely erased the train, but kept the material. The material is a crescendo, sound gets more and more important, and a glissando towards the high frequencies. So this is what it gives. So it follows exactly the same pattern of the train. Same duration, starts from nothing, grows up, makes a glissando. But on the second sound, there's no way I could recognize it as being a train. So when I'm composing, I can decide to use the train sound as it is to generate in you as listeners the faculty of reproducing in your mind this train sound. But I can use the second version in which I develop a different way of listening to the same sound. So this is much of the work I do at least, but many of us do because I know the work of many people. And it's a way we deal with sound and with this idea of listening to the sound independently of the cause. So other concepts were related to the sound object. I won't go through all of them, but Schaeffer created all a series of concepts. Corps sonore. Sounding body is not exactly 
a good translation, but I couldn't find anyone I think better. This is the sounding body. It's, a sound, it's an object with which I can produce sound. Ah, in fact, we're surrounded by sound <laughs> bodies. But musically, I can say, OK, this is an interesting sound. I will record it and use it to create something else. Then we have écoute réduite, which means it's a fact of what I explained before of listening to the sound, forgetting its origin, listening to its characteristics. And then objet convenable, objet musical, objet étendu, objet tendu, objet animé, objet composé, objet composite, of which I only retain the two first. This is Schaeffer's categorization. So I can produce sounds objects anytime, but there are some objects that are more convenient for making music, and some objects that are so convenient that they are already musical objects, that they are like prepared sounds for music. In fact, Schaeffer wrote a famous book called the Traité des Objets Musicaux, the Treaty of so musical, musical Objects, not of Sound Objects. But of course, in this treaty, he explains all the characteristics of Sound Objects. So his idea was in order to work with Sound Objects, as you see, I'm not still uh, yet criticizing the sound object. Schaeffer developed a classification system based on what he calls the type of morphology, which describes sounds on two criteria. Typology, what kind of sound it is, and morphology, how is it evolving in time. Let's go back to the dog. I listen to a dog barking. Typology, dog. Morphology, angry dog. That's my deduction. Or happy dog, or whatever. I get the image, I identify the source, and then I see what happens with that source. That is how you listen. All of us listen. And this is an interesting fact that there are two concepts to describe one thing, which is sound and which is the basic of computing. The basic of computing is if you need two informations to have one description. So here we have these two elements, and he created a series of sound descriptors in order to classify sounds. It's ways of saying this sound has a grain, this sound has a mass, this has has an iteration, this is a large note, etc. I won't go into the details, and dozens of other descriptions that are found in his famous book, which was translated to English some four or five years ago. So, it was initially an open approach, and here comes my historical criticism. Initially, there were no rules. However, little by little, Schaeffer introduced perceptual and functional rules that somehow oriented it towards an aesthetic despotism. You should work this way. You should not use these kind of sounds. Sound objects should not be too long or too short. What does that mean? I don't know. But probably is not. Um, or oh, the, the piece we listened to yesterday, Barry Truax, River Run, is a very long object. So it's too long. It should be a kind of unit with a kind of beginning and a kind of end. It should have a regular shape. Wow. That's a very beautiful sound object. Wow. Maybe not. Too complicated. 
They should be made of sounds that don't have any anecdotic connotation. My train, forbidden. Because you recognize the source. In fact, he was thinking in traditional terms. As I said before, I'm listening to the piano and I listen to a noise. I don't integrate that as being a part of the music. And if I close the door and it makes a whining sound as a violin, I don't say it's a violin because it's not in the context of music. So music creates a listening context, traditional instruments, I mean. They should be classified and organized following specific criteria to be defined. In the same way, classical music has a set of internal rules that control the seismic evolution, music concrete should also create a set of rules. You cannot compose if you don't have rules. That's a very traditional. If you have made musical studies, you have studied a harmony. Harmony has no relation with music. But it is necessary to study harmony to make music. It's a way of thinking. It's not a method of composing. Composers should learn how to listen to sound objects in order to understand their intrinsic rules and constraints. This is probably the most real or uh, still applicable idea. Composers quickly react against these rules and start doing whatever they wanted. This started creating a strong conflict between Schaeffer and the composers who wouldn't follow these, this set of rules. They were all against him. There's a great composer that passed away 15 years ago called Luc Ferrari. Luc Ferrari made a, word, a work made only of anecdotic sounds. He was kicked out of the GRM because he had gone against the rules. This is why I'm talking of despotism. So here are my comments on the concept of sound object. Initially, it was a needed operating concept. We needed something to work with sound, permitting composers to talk about sound independently of their parameters. Until then, composers didn't give a damn about sound. They had the instruments, they would combine them, create new sounds, combining instruments, but the nature of sounds and the nature of sound behavior was not their concern. The musical world was there. Here's my main critic. The idea of sound as an object is strongly related to our visual representation of things. An object has limits and boundaries and tends to be solid. This is quite inconvenient for sound description. This is an object. See, it has a start, a beginning or an end, or a beginning or an end. It's not too long, not too short. It has a form. It's closed. But if I sing, how should that be integrated? Because when Schaeffer started working on sound objects, and you will see it in his treaty, he said, well, I have to imagine something that would englobe all the music that was ever produced. So this includes classical music, for example. How do you reduce a symphony to sound objects? How can you imagine objects? What is sound? Sound is nothing perceptible to our vision, to our touch. And we're using the same word with which you describe visual or tactile objects. His Traité des objets musicaux is in some way, sorry, Schaeffer wanted the theory of musique concrète as a traditional theory of music. However, it was a totally new road for experimentation and invention no subject to pre-existing rules. And this was the wonderful thing with musique concrète. And this is what composers really loved. I can do with sound what I want. 
And more and more we advance through time, more and more this concept is so strong. Making music is just doing what you want with any sound. It's my problem to make it sound in a way that will have some kind of impact on your listening. But I'm free to do what I want. So his traité is a theory of musique concrète, but it's impossible to operate with this concept. You read it and you say, I won't make music anymore. Because there are so many rules, so many concepts, so many things that you have to take into account. And I would say it's more a book on aesthetic of sounds and its behavior in music. This is the important side of the book. He explains music in a different way. In fact, he was wanting to understand how composers compose, more than composing himself. He wanted to know what's happening in composers' heads. That's why he started putting rules to composition. However, his wonderful work opened the road to the understanding of a need of operation, classification, tools, and concepts. Classification is the world, but how? So composers deal with thousands of sounds in their creation process. They need to organize them in order to deal with them and find them quickly during their compositional process. I say piano, no problem. You all imagine immediately. I say the sound I made five minutes ago with a bottle. Well, it's still a bit fresh in your mind and you see the object and you have some experience of it. But tomorrow and the day after, how can I remember that sound? And when I have hundreds of sounds, how can, how can I have them in my mind without having to spend my day listening to all the sounds? So here's classification enters. Many systems have been imagined like Schaeffer typo morphology. François Bell has his Imson theory. There's another temporal semiotic units and many others. There has been like a kind of a contest or quest to finding the ideal system for classifying sounds. But the important thing is not to classify sounds. Is does this help me in my everyday work? In fact, what is important is to find sounds, not to have a perfect classification system, but an efficient system for finding your own sound or any other sound. Almost finished. The key word is description. When we work with sounds, and particularly with hundreds of sounds, it is important to be able to remember them, thus find your own sounds. In this process, naming a sound is essential it creates a link to our memory. So choosing a name is very important. So I have a, a sound which has no name. I'll try to put a name on it. So we will listen to the sound. So, what name do I put to it? I have many different criteria to describe the sound. I can describe it through its rhythm, eventually through the pitch. At the end, there are some pitch issues. Dynamics, timber, looks like a guitar, or abstract concepts 
dancing on the floor, my mother sweeping the patio, things like that. There is no precision. What is important is that I can remember a sound through its descriptor. So when I see its name, I say, oh, it's that sound. Once again, the sound is fresh in your memory. What will happen tomorrow? You will have forgotten it. So this sound I called. I didn't call it. Did I? It's always take some time. There. Arriving rhythm. Because the strongest impact it made on my, my perception. You don't have to share what I'm saying. It's my perception. It's me operating with sounds. So it's the fact that it's something that seems to be arriving and is very regularly organized. That's how I called it. Because it's for me, it's the best criteria for creating a memory link. And the object is to represent myself those sounds. I don't want to. So here's an example, just an image of a work where you have a certain number of sounds. Don't try to get in, well, the image is not very clear, but so every sound has a name, a duration. For me, there, there's something a bit fuzzy here, and we already described that in, in reflection groups, is that uh, these things look a lot like objects. They're rectangles. So I'm describing something that cannot be uh, seen as an object, as a visual representation. But we can live with that. So each of these sounds has a name. So here's the list of the sounds in that work. So you can see my criteria. First, I may describe the sound in any language. Second, I have totally different criteria. What impacts me in the first place is what I take it as the strongest way of describing. I will get into a little detail. I may use something like TTD. That remembers me a work by François Bell called Tremblement de Terre Très Doux, which is always known as TTTD. In fact, there's a T missing. So, that immediately sends me to that work and the Im strong impression in my memory that were made. China, you can, I don't know if you can imagine, but it has something to do with Chinese music or with my own representation of Chinese music because this. Or I may, may use something, for example, this, the fourth one, F L Etir Pitch Ak. There, I'm describing the, pro the technical process I use to create that sound. And now, this would be my, my last slide. So, how does this work when composing? The sound classification criteria are diverse and even contradictory. Here is a short, a short sorry, list of them. This is the analysis criteria I may use. Traditional musical parameters. Sometimes it's easier to describe the sound with the score. So use the score. Then timber, guitar. Real or almost real timber. It sounds to my ear like a guitar, even if it's not a guitar. But it's the link that is strong, that is important. Behavior. This is Schaeffer, morphology, goes up, goes down, etc., etc. Remembers me something, a sound I know well, a music, an event, very strong memory, the TTTD I talked about. Generates a sensation, cold sound, bitter sound. Production technology, I use GRM tools, this, this uh, plugin, etc., etc. Some particular aspect, sometimes technical, distorted sound. I don't use distorted sounds. So whenever I have one, I will put that down, because I know. 
and feelings, angry, happy, etc., you can continue with this list of possible ways. And the important thing, as I said earlier, is not, it doesn't have to be real. It has to work for you. It's your own classification system. Then, of course, we could go further on and talk about how we can group sounds into folders. We make a, a, when you find sounds that have a similar criteria, you put them together. Some years ago, to finish, I'll tell you this short story. We developed a very interesting project conceptually, which was the fact of developing an automatic classifier of sounds. So you put a sound in the system, and it goes there. I define the criteria. So there is where we started working with all these concepts of criteria, general criteria. And we worked with different, we had four main categories, an exotical category, behavior category, a sensation category, and technical category. And from the technological point of view, because it was a technological project, the idea was the following. Let's say I create a folder where I, with the following name, which is uh, anxious sounds, sounds that produce anxiety, or terrifying sounds. So, I don't know what a terrifying sound is, but that sound I made you listen is terrifying. So I put it inside. Then I find a totally different sound and put it inside. So I put there five, six different sounds. Then I ask the system, hey, go and look in all my collection of sounds. If based on the terrifying sounds you have, you can find other ones. And so it was a spectral, different kind of technical analysis that would find sounds that have some relation with that terrifying sounds. And then would bring me back a list of sounds that correspond to that criteria, which I would introduce or not, and thus enrich the batter days. Base. That is, is what we call our, today uh, artificial intelligence, to set a, a set of basic items or concepts and then try to, to enlarge it and to make it more and more wide. So, that's the end of it. So, to conclude, I come back to my two criteria, why I'm against the concept of object, because it has a st so strong visual impact and, and morphological impact that I take it away. And secondly, because historically it was useful at the beginning, but created more conflicts than it brought solutions. And whenever you talk of the composure of that generation of sound objects, they just fly away. They don't want to listen about that. Okay, that was the first thing. Let it be. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, first of all, we can really take one question because we're running a little bit out of time. You started late, huh? Uh, yeah, we all started late, you know. So, but yeah, first of all, thanks. And um, <coughs> I'm not a person of the old generation, so I, I, I made a lot of sense, uh, sense of your talk today. Thanks for that. Brilliant. So, uh, sound object uh, is dead. Viva uh, the sound object, I would absolutely, say. Absolutely, absolutely. And let's right. take a question, and then I think we need a break a little bit after, and then we go to Armando. Yeah, I think the so. Question? The question, question, question. You don't give any opportunity for the No, no, I said, and then. Ah. And my question is, you mentioned, when you were speaking about uh, the new sounds, you mentioned discovering the sounds and describing them. Yeah. And then uh, what you demonstrated when you showed the sound of the train and the new sound looked a bit like engineering a new sound. And I would like to point to attention and ask you maybe to elaborate. There might be a tension between vague description of the sound that has been discovered 
and kind of precise description of how a new sound has been engineered. Um, and maybe there is no contradiction in fact there, but it, it looks like a contradiction to me. Uh, while passing by the microphone, I think it doesn't sound like a short question at all, but we now have a, 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 a topic for the next year conference. Of no, 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 but it, 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 give me a little chance to say something. <laughs> there's no contradiction because there's no method. Uh, contradiction starts when you have a defined road and you don't follow it. So I have the first sound, the first sound how do I call it? Train. Or I even give the name of the train, which is R-E-R -E -R, train. The second sound, how do I describe it? Through a technological procedure. I use resonant filters to produce it. S through the impact of the result. Uh, sound, li little bells going up. Through the fact that it's the train transformed, etc., etc. I try to find the concept that is more appealing to my memory. That, that, that's the main criteria. So, and, at the, and there's also no contradiction because I do what I want. <laughs> I mean, it's my music. It's my risk of using something. And, I'm, I'm, and you listen to my music, you may like it, criticize it. But I also try to listen to my music. I don't just only think about it. I try to put myself in the other side of the, as a listener. So that's all, my friend. No, it's not all, but we'll come back to this in a bigger term once, I'm quite sure. Thank you, and uh, Armando, I think... We'll probably need five or ten minutes here, yeah? and then we, we meet us here again. Thanks. <laughs>